thank you so much for coming. Tim, hello. <laughs> um, this is a really, uh, really lovely turnout. And I know that you could be outside. And this is layout weather for mm -hmm. Ohio, isn't it? So um, thank you for coming here for an hour and hearing me and hopefully engaging in conversation and asking me questions that will propel me to get this paper submitted, um, which is right here. Laura was asking. It's right here. <laughs> um, but this is based on some work that my team and I have been engaged in um, for the last couple of years. And I want to start off by showing them off. Um, so this is the team that I work with. This is my research lab. And some of them are actually here now. You might recognize some faces. Um, but they are really instrumental in getting this work um, out and in helping me make sense and um, ask questions and challenge me. And um, we challenge each other. So um, the team includes some doc students, um, an undergrad and a master's student. And you can see us in sort of you know, very important conversation, um, thinking about these, uh, these ideas that we have about how to better understand emergent bilinguals, particularly emergent bilinguals who are um, teeny tiny in the early childhood years. Um, and I especially want to acknowledge Alain, who is the person in the top left corner. He is my co-author, Alain Bengochea, on this paper. And he'll actually be visiting in a couple of weeks because he's interviewing for a postdoc position here. Um, and so I do want to give him uh, props. So they help with all the transcription. They actually collected all the data. You can see them in the classroom there, um, which was a two-year project in one of the local preschools in Miami-Dade County, where I most recently um, was. So. The work is based on, like I said, a two-year project in, um, in the context of Miami-Dade County, which is a really multilingual, multicultural, um, and rich space to understand bilingual development in general, but particularly in children, because bilingualism in Miami-Dade County is the norm. Most children, even if their homes are not bilingual, the community is so bilingual that you cannot go anywhere without hearing another language. It's quite a different context from Columbus, even though there are obviously lots of other languages in Columbus. But um, they're not in pockets like they are in Columbus. In Miami, anywhere you go, you hear people either using it with each other or um, in the businesses that you, um, that you encounter to get your morning cafecito or to pick up your groceries or even to pump gas. There are uh, lots of different languages, particularly the most prevalent languages in Miami-Dade County are Spanish, as you can imagine. That is sort of the national trend. But also Haitian, Creole, Portuguese, lots of Brazilian um, recent immigrants, um, lots of Latin American, so lots of different varieties of Spanish. Um, and also there's been um, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of other languages that you hear not so consistently as Spanish, Portuguese, and Haitian Creole, but there's tremendous, um, uh, lots, lots of vacationers from Europe. And so you hear, and Asia, so you hear all kinds of languages. It's sort of like when you go to Disney World, that's what Miami's like all the time. Um, so it's a great place to study and try to understand emergent bilingualism in children, uh, particularly not only because it's prevalent and present, but because it's highly, highly valued. And so even parents who cannot themselves um, raise their children bilingually in sort of their own language use. They try to seek out spaces and they try to seek out um, schools where children can uh, be supported in developing bilingualism. What we try to do is we try to find those spaces, particularly those school-based, those official um, school-based spaces where bilingualism is uh, being supported. So not that it's just happening haphazardly, but it's very strategic and intentional. And we've been working for the last couple of years with a preschool that is um, run by United Way that serves children from all over the county. Um, children start at six weeks old and they go there through the end of preschool um, till about five when they're ready to go into kindergarten. And they've adopted a really interesting model um, for dual language uh, immersion, which I'll talk about in a minute. But what we've been doing for the last couple of years, we just finished data collecting in May, is spending one morning a week in each of the four preschool classrooms. Um, and when I say we, I really mean my doc students, because um, they're the ones that are on the ground and have been doing all the data collection. And one of the spaces that we're, we were really interested in learning more about was um, the time of day, which was free choice. 
And within that free choice time, several different things are happening around the room, but kids get um, to choose what they want to work on that day and where they want to spend those 45 minutes. One of those spaces is sociodramatic play. Now, I don't know how familiar you are with sociodramatic play. Some of you might be. If you study early childhood, you, you are. Um, but if you're in elementary, kids don't get to play that much anymore. Um, so you may not be familiar with it. But I wanted to talk a little bit to situate the work uh, within this space in sociodramatic play. Um, because there's been a, a shift away from um, um, understanding the value of play in children's development toward more academic school-like things, right? And we see that shift coming into preschool more and more where some of these spaces that are legitimate learning spaces and powerful learning spaces for children are disappearing. Um, the research actually shows that sociodramatic play is a very valuable place and space and time for children to develop language and literacy skills, also to develop agency, also to develop and enact their creativity in order to um, work out and get to practice some of the things that they've been learning through life, right? So they get to en um, enhance and they get to enact some of their experiences that they've had outside of school. They get to take on roles, they get to create stories and storylines, they get to ask questions they get to um, tell people what to do, they get to um, use objects for different purposes, whether the objects were intended for those purposes or not, but they sort of get to re, um, reposition and reappropriate objects um, and give them some other identity. Um, and, and so it is a very powerful learning arena, um, particularly for young children, where this is a space that they control, they get to decide what happens, and they very, mu they very much take charge of their learning there. Um, there is some sociodramatic play spaces where teachers play an active role in sort of guiding the direction of play. In this particular space that we were studying, the teacher played a minimal role, and um, that doesn't mean that she didn't come into the space sometimes, but when she did, it was mostly to um, sort of help to navigate if there were any conflicts or just to check in on the kids. But for the most part, there are two teachers, and I'll talk about that in a minute. For the most part in this space, it was kid run. Um, which made it very interesting because, you know, four-year-olds are trying to learn to use language for different functions, which is one of the things that we're particularly studying. And sometimes they don't quite have those skills worked out, and so there's some, you know, there's some interactions which the teacher needed to redirect. But for the most part, it was a space where kids um, were engaging in joint pretense and they were collaboratively trying to negotiate their place, their identity, their role, and how objects were to be used in that space. Um, and as I mentioned, sociodramatic play um, has been studied in many ways showing how lots of language and literate uses that are school-like or that um, children wind up that wind up serving children as they move on into the um, school grades, like storytelling and creating sequence of events, all of that happens in sociodramatic play. So it really is a fruitful um, and interesting place to study and also a place to learn. So particularly the focus um, of our work is young emergent bilinguals, as I started to say. Um, and I wanted to use a little bit of time to define this term that I use. Um, I'm not sure how familiar you are with the term emergent bilinguals. Okay. So you'll see terms like limited English proficient. You'll see terms like English language learner, language minority student. Are those more familiar to you? Or is all of it new? Because I'll define it all. <laughs> um, those are the more common terms that you see in the literature, right? And so there, those terms I purposely choose not to use because although they're talking about the same kind of child that I'm talking about, those terms really focus on um, only part of what the child can do. And if you think about the way that those terms define the child or refer to the child, it's it really points to what the child can't do yet or can't do well yet. And so I choose to use the term emergent bilingual, and I'm not the only one, by the way, this isn't something that I created. Um, there's a trend in bilingual research to use this term to look at the child more holistically and to really represent not only what the child is in the process of acquiring, um, but also what the child has the potential to become. So these children have the potential to become bilinguals if supported in their environment, and that environment includes home and school and then the spaces outside um, and around those. So um, the definition that I use for emergent bilinguals are children who are acquiring two or more languages, including literacy skills, and who with ongoing support show potential for bilingual and biliterate proficiency. Um, 
So Laura mentioned ideology. This certainly is an ideological stance um, because it's positioning children from a, position, from a place of, um, of um, what they can do, what they have the potential to do, and looking at them as um, active users of language, as strategic users of language, and also as uh, proficient users of language. They're not adults, they're little kids, they're obviously still learning. But certainly they use these languages given where they currently are in their development to meet their everyday needs. Um, so there's some ideology there. <laughs> Um, so when we think about the theoretical framing um, that supports this work, I frame it around this notion of syncretism within a sociocultural framework. And I won't say too much about this um, because I can, we can really talk lots of theory if you'd like, um, but just to situate it, um, it's thinking about the ways and the, and the places and the things that learners draw from, particularly learners who are growing up in these spaces and with these um, experiences that draw and merge culturally diverse traditions, including languages, um, and how these inform and organize their language and literacy activities. Um, Sociodramatic play as a situated activity um, also allows uh, for the use of linguistic and cultural resources to be internalized by these children um, and, and um, for them to draw on and expand the social forms of their language and literacy behaviors within this space. Further, I use translanguaging um, as a theoretical framework. And for those of you that are not familiar with this term or this notion of translanguaging, um, it's the idea that um, you, language, the term and the notion of language shifts from a noun to a verb. Right? Because language is something we do, it's not something we own. Right? And so these children not only language, but they translanguage because they go in and out and they blend the different ways of using language and the different experiences they have with language um, in their everyday practice. And, we, and positioning translanguaging or bilingualism as a normal language practice. Yes? Are you, are you intending to mean they go back and forth between both languages? That's one of the, yep, that's one of the things and that I mean. They mix the, they mix the structures that's the another thing that it includes, yeah. That's right, that's right, that's right. So it's this notion that we all are language users. Language is not something we own, language is something we do because it's a functional, um, it's a functional resource for us, right? That's one of the things that makes us uniquely human. Um, but, we, but the reason that it serves our purposes is because we use it to, mean, to meet different needs. Um, so languages are seen as integrated for bilinguals or for emergent bilinguals. Languages are seen as integrated systems from which they draw for a variety of uh, purposes in different contexts. And also languages and cultural repertoires are resources that they use for meaning making and um, learning. Okay, so that's the theoretical framing that I, um, that I draw on. So you'll hear me use that term translanguaging quite a bit um, and syncretism. So in this uh, particular analysis that is drawn from the larger study, we're focusing, as I mentioned, on sociodramatic play and the way that children use their emerging language uh, proficiencies, language resources, and cultural resources um, to support their play. So the research questions are, what oral discourse functions support the sociodramatic play of young emergent bilinguals with varying bilingual proficiencies, which is very important there's a lot of myths surrounding bilingualism, and one of them is that the only people that count as bilinguals is if they speak both of their languages to equal degrees, and that's one of the most prevalent and most problematic myths because no real bilingual that breathes and has blood running through their bodies actually speaks any number of languages to equal proficiencies because bilinguals don't use their languages for the same purposes and, for this, and in the same amount of time. So they don't need to speak um, their languages in the same exact way or have equal proficiencies. So these, and particularly because these are little kids, they have varying proficiencies in each language. The second uh, question is how do children draw on their developing bilingual and uh, cultural resources to mediate social interactions? So I'm looking at um, what discourse functions they draw on, what oral discourse functions they draw on to support their play and also how they draw on their emerging bilingualism and their cultural resources in this space. A little bit more background about the setting. So I mentioned that this was um, early childhood um, program and K 
kids started as early as six weeks, and there were several different, um, there was an infant program, a toddler program, and then the preschool program. We were focusing on the preschool program and the four preschool classrooms. This particular analysis comes from one of those four classrooms, and it comes from only one of those classrooms because this was the only classroom that consistently um, included dramatic play as one of the options for children. The other classrooms either didn't really have a space set up for that or only had it for a little bit of the time, and if they did, they consistently didn't offer it as a space where kids could choose um, to go spend their free choice time. So on a weekly basis, um, in the Spanish-English dual language program, we videotaped one morning a week, and we captured everything that happened during that morning, and consistently every morning kids got to choose uh, during free time what they wanted to do, and this was a space that was always available to them. This particular program um, is unique in terms of what you see in the literature if you study or if you read dual language programs and the configuration of them. Um, the name dual language is sort of an umbrella term for programs that use two languages for instruction. This one I would consider to be quite a hybrid um, type of program because the language policy was what I term parallel monolingual language policy, which meant that there w they intended to have languages separated in some way, so they wanted to uh, make sure that they had models of each of the target languages. Uh, the way that they separated those models was by teacher. So one teacher in each room was designated as the Spanish model, and the other teacher in the same room was designated as the English model. And you can imagine that um, teachers had varying levels of bilingual, as bilingual proficiencies themselves. But these teachers were in the room at the same time always. And so even though they were trying to create a space where languages were separated, it was a bilingual space because one teacher always had to use Spanish and the other teacher always had to use English even when they were talking to each other. So, <laughs> so that's why I call it a parallel monolingual, uh, bilingual space, which sounds really tricky. Um, but the teachers for the most part were true to the model that they were supposed to enact. That does not mean that sometimes they did not code switch themselves, but it wasn't it wasn't very typical, it was pretty rare actually. Now, that did not reflect children's language use, right? Children's language use was much more hybrid as you'll see in some of the data that I'm gonna show you. But that gives you a sense of um, what the models for language were in these spaces. Um, and in every room, as I mentioned, there were two teachers. One was a Spanish model, one was the English model, and they each had varying degrees of bilingualism. For the most part, the Spanish model was um, more bilingual than the English model. And that's just a general trend that happens in bilingual programs. Um, oh, is my time up? No. <laughs> um, so the participants in this particular classroom were um, 17 students, Spanish, English, emergent bilinguals. And they all were, um, they, were, they came from Latino homes, so their parents uh, were Latino. And of course, that included a lot of different um, ethnic and cultural backgrounds, right? So they're um, Cuban parents, and they were Dominican, and Puerto Rican, and Venezuelan, and pretty much all of Latin America was represented. Um, and, and US born as well, but this was um, their cultural heritage that was represented. The ages of the children ranged from um, three years, four months, to five years, um, zero months. So this was a multi-age classroom. Children usually spent two years in this class. Um, and so the 3.4 represented the youngest group. Um, and then the ones that were four on were kids that had already been there for, two year, for uh, uh, one year, and this was their second year. Does that make sense? Um, a little bit about meta, uh, how we collected our data, and if anybody wants to talk some more about ethnomethodology and case study, I'd love to, but I'm not going to say so much about it because I don't want to spend all the time. Um, but this is a qualitative study, and I'd love to talk theory, and I'd love to talk methods if you're interested in it. Come ask me questions afterwards. Um, but like I said, we were in there in this classroom, um, and these data come from the first year. So we were there for two years. These come from the first year. So over the course of a year, um, we were in there weekly, once a week, all morning. We video recorded everything that happened. We didn't change anything. We tried to not interfere at all. And in the video, um, you'll get a sense of how the camera was set up. And so um, we did not, um, we didn't intervene. We didn't do anything. And sometimes kids asked um, the data collectors, but usually they didn't. And we stayed out of their way and they stayed out of our way. Um, but we were focusing on child and 
child peer and child teacher interactions in sociodramatic play and also self-talk because sometimes kids play, play by themselves. Um, which is really fun too, to, to sort of hear how they navigate that space when they have no playmates. Um, we engaged in purposeful sampling. So after we um, looked at the range of uh, dramatic play videos that we had to choose from, there were 27 uh, dramatic play sessions over the course of that year and they ranged from 45 minutes to an hour. So from those 27 over the course of the year, we um, looked through them very carefully and engaged in purposeful sampling to find students that we could focus our analysis on who, number one, played in dramatic play often because remember kids had a choice they could have gone to block corner or they could have been on the computers or they could have been in the art corner or whatever um, some of the other choices were so kids that consistently chose to be in dramatic uh, play so we had a number of videos um, with the same children um, we tried to look for dyads or triad that played together so that we also could have kids that had developed some relationship um, in this space and we can get a sense of the roles that they took on and how that emerged and also kids that were verbal when they played because a lot of kids play silently um, and so that was going to only help us this much if we were looking at oral interactions and so that those are some of the criteria that we used for our purposeful sampling techniques and we wound up um, with three kids in particular um, Aaron, Aidan, or actually Aron, Aron, Aidan and Melissa and um, we developed three case studies. I'm hoping to have time to talk about two of those today. So we'll see how it goes. Um, Arong and Melissa, Melissa. And so a little bit about them, but I'll tell you some more in a minute. Arong, um, four years and 11 months old when data collection started, native bilingual, which means that from birth he learned uh, both Spanish and English. He uh, was growing up in a bilingual home where both languages were used. Aidang, age four years two, and two months at the beginning of data collection, also a native bilingual, but a different configuration of how he came to be a native bilingual. So native bilingual means that from birth you learn two languages. Um, his parents um, were English speakers, but they had, he had a Spanish speaking babysitter or nanny. And so from birth he interacted and spent as much time with her probably as with the parents, if not maybe more. Um, so that's how he came to, um, to be exposed and to have the opportunity to grow up as a native bilingual. Uh, but at the time of the study, by the time he got into preschool, he was demonstrating stronger English skills um, because his parents were English uh, speakers. And um, Elisa is the third student that we focused on and she's four years old and four months at the beginning of data collection. And remember, this is over the course of a year. So by the end of it, she was, um, she was five, over five and ready to go to kindergarten. Um, native Spanish speaker, Spanish was the only language used at home um, and she was demonstrating stronger Spanish skills um, during the time that we were um, collecting the data and doing, um, and doing this work. So we analyzed patterns of children's purposeful play related um, language functions. We're interested in not only what their language looks like, but the purpose of them, why they were using language and how they were using language. What were they doing with language? Um, because remember that our theoretical framing positions language as a, as a verb, as something you do, right? Um, and also looking at their translanguaging practice, so not only the purposes for their language use, but also how they blended and drew from both of the languages that they had access to um, in their environment. Um, and from those 20-something um, uh, sessions that we had, we uh, wound up doing deep analysis and more focused anal analysis on nine sessions because those nine sessions involved all three of these students, either in dyads or triads, but at some point in those nine sessions, all these students played a role. Um, and we did that through ethnomethodology and case study approach. Okay, so to start, um, any questions so far? Okay. So to give you an overview of the findings and um, some sort of big picture, cross case analyses or results of um, when we compared across the cases, particularly because I'm not going to talk about Aidan. So this gives you a sense of across the three children that we focused on. Um, what we um, saw was that at the end of the year and over the course of these children playing together and playing in this space. They drew upon a variety of language functions and they're developing dual language proficiencies or repertoire um, and sociolinguistic competence 
to engage with play with each other and with objects in this space. They demonstrated and developed uh, a keen awareness and responsiveness to peers uh, and teachers' dual language abilities and preferences, which is one of the things I'm going to focus on when I get into the cases. Um, really interesting research actually shows that from very early on, um, young bilinguals can tell who speaks what in their environment, and they choose their language accordingly. And so they know that if you're bilingual, because they pay attention to what people say, they can address you in either of the languages or they can code mix with you. But if they have a sense that you are monolingual or stronger in one of the languages and don't really use one, the other language very much, they more like, they're less likely to code switch with folks that, they, that sort of fit that profile. And these children certainly demonstrated that keen awareness and they tried to be as responsive as possible possible within their own um, abilities because, uh, for example, Melissa was a Spanish dominant child and so her English was still emergent. But I'll show you how she enacted this, um, this responsiveness to, to her peers and to her teacher's dual language abilities in a minute. But all three of them did this and in general all of the kids in this space did this. Um, they also enacted their bilingualism in flexible and effective ways to support engagement in play but in different ways. They each had unique ways of enacting their bilingualism and again that related to their bilingual profile. Whether they were comfortable bilinguals, meaning they had facility in either language, whether they were stronger in one language or the other. Um, so that was a really interesting finding. Um, and also we um, found across the cases that translanguaging practices included both productive and receptive bilingual ways of languaging. I'll tell you a little bit about what that means and then in the data in a second I'll, you'll see what I mean. Um, but when we think about translanguaging, um, the gentleman over here point, asked that question, which was a very good question to ask, actually, um, because you, bilinguals engage in translanguaging in different ways. You can enact your bilingualism receptively by engaging in a parallel monolingual co uh, conversation, which means that um, you speak to me in Spanish and I respond to you in English because I know that you're going to understand me, but at no point do I produce Spanish right? But I'm still engaging bilingually with you, right? Or I can engage in a bilingual conversation, a productive bilingual conversation by using either language or both, right? And so we saw that in these children in really interesting ways, but with different people depending on who the interlocutor was and what their perceived um, notion of that child's preference or strength was in language. I'll show you some examples. Any questions about that? Does that give anybody seizures? <laughs> Monique says it gives her seizures, so I'm always <laughs> very conscious of that. Okay, so this is Aron. The pointer's not working, so I'll use my pointer. Um, and he's the first case that I want to present and focus on. And um, the findings position Aron as a versatile dual language arbiter and play communicator. Okay, and I'll tell you what that means. So Aron was the boy that navigated this space by taking charge and directing not only his play but everybody else's play around him. But also he was very, very good and very skilled at integrating others into play, into joint play, um, who otherwise would have probably continued to play separately. Okay? And he did this through language. And he did this in very, very skilled and flexible and versatile ways. Um, so he's a great kid to study because he's sort of like your mayor, okay? The mayor of the classroom. Um, he also was very effective in convincing people to play what he wanted to play and that <laughs> objects were what he said they were, right? So he was very strategic and very skilled and he did all that through language and he did all that through two languages. Um, so a little bit more about Aron. As I mentioned before, um, he was four years and 11 months at the beginning of data collection. He came from a bilingual home and a bilingual environment in, in his home where both parents spoke English and Spanish. He also had an older brother who was seven years old, but he spoke English with his older brother, okay, which tells you a little bit of something, a little bit about um, language shift as kids get a little older, right? So his brother had already started, and for several years before that, choosing um, to use English exclusively in the house, even though the parents were speaking to him in both languages, and with Aron, the brother um, used English exclusively. Um, Aron demonstrated strong receptive and expressive language skills in both Spanish and English, and this was based on um, interviews with the teacher and also um, formal and informal assessments that the, the school conducts on all of the children. Um, 
he was the most verbally productive child in our sample. He was always talking, which is great when you want to study language use, right? So we knew that he had to be one of the children that we were going to focus on. Um, he also was not only verbally productive, really verbally productive, but um, he was very strategic and flexible. And so he used, um, he, he enacted lot language for lots of different functions. Um, so his talk in sociodramatic play served a variety of, fu of functions. So as play arbiter, he made judgments on peers' um, play actions. He told them whether that was going to happen or not going to happen, and whether that was good or not good, or whether that could count as play or whether that couldn't count as play. Um, he also exerted influence on the direction of play in, the, in those same ways. He would tell children, this is what's going to happen now, this is what we're doing, this is what we just finished doing, and this is what you're going to do when you play with us. Okay. Um, as play communicator, he articulated the objectives of play, um, telling people sort of what the next steps were going to be and what the plan was. He relayed past play events to new players. That's how he got kids to come and join play. Right? He said, we just finished doing this. Now we're going to do this other thing. And so he filled the space in for kids so that they could get a broad conception of what's been happening. Um, he also brought together concurrent but disconnected play events. So this space was not very big, but it was big enough where several children fit at the same time, and also where several play events could be happening without necessarily them being connected. So a child could be over here sweeping, and another child could be over here organizing pots and pans, and somebody else could be over here setting the table, but they weren't talking to each other. Aron is the boy that told everybody how all of those events related to each other and how they were all really connected. And he brought people in to play, um, which is really fascinating to see him do that. Sometimes he did it in what could be construed as a little bit of aggressive ways. Other, other times he did it in gentler ways. Um, but in all of those different varieties of ways that he did it, he did it through language. And he did it through both languages. As a flexible language user, um, he was a very, very, um, proficient bilingual. Now, he's four years and 11 months, so you can imagine. He doesn't sound like an adult bilingual. He sounds like a four-year and 11-month-old bilingual, but very skilled bilingual and very versatile and very confident and very um, uh, able to express his intentions in either language. Um, he drew on his bilingual repertoire to achieve communicative goals. He aligned his language choice with those of um, what he perceived to be those of his interlocutors. And so he really um, was attentive to people's stronger proficiency levels or um, their, their preference um, for language. And he, frequent, he frequently code switched with other flexible proficient bilinguals and peers, um, but he used monolingual speech with children who he perceived to be dominant in one language or the other, which is different from the way that Melissa, the other case study I'm going to um, present to you, uh, exhibited her bilingualism. So keep, keep that in mind. <coughs> um, I have a little clip that, um, that actually shows Arong and his friends in this. Oh, and the formatting got messed up again. I just fixed it. Sorry about that. It's supposed to be over here. Um, but this is just to give you a preview of the video that you're about to watch, which has the captions. So you'll be able to follow it because it sounds very noisy. In the classrooms when we collected the video, we had really powerful mics which was great, but there's a lot of noise and it sounds like chaos. But the reason it sounds like chaos is because you can hear the kids from way in the other side of the room that are playing in the other spaces. So I wanted to show you the transcript so that you wouldn't be, um, you wouldn't get a headache when you saw the video. Uh, but this is, uh, this is um, one particular little tiny 15 second excerpt from a play event where Aron, before Manuel comes into the play, Aron had set up this very elaborate situation where he was playing with a baby, he was bathing the baby, it was a baby, um, he was changing the baby's diaper, he was feeding the baby, he had this whole thing planned out and set up, right? And he happened to step away for a minute. And in comes Manuel, and he pulls something out of the cabinet that Aron had just put there. And it was a plastic milk bottle, it was actually from McDonald's, which is kind of important because this is why Aron gets really upset at Manuel, because he changes what the bottle, where the bottle came from. Um, and it was a little bottle that he was using to feed the baby, but he happened to set it down for a second and stepped away. Manuel comes in and he grabs it and he starts to sort of try to make sense of it. That's a burger. He's referring to the plastic bottle and I'll play the video in a second. Um, and he goes, he moves over to the teacher who happens to be sitting in the space with another little girl playing something else. And he says, look, look at the back. 
Burger King, hey, trying to get their attention. Then Aron comes in, notices that he had taken one of the objects that he had appropriated, thank you. He had appropriated as something else, definitely not a Burger King bottle, um, and it was specifically a milk bottle for the baby. And he says, that's not the Burger King, ponelo allá. Okay, you see some code switching there, you see some translanguaging. Now, Aron does this because he knows that Manuel is a flexible bilingual as he is, and so he's gonna understand him in either way. Um, and I have the translation in parentheses, by the way. And then he says, es para tomar, es para el niño, right? So he's appropriating what the object of that, um, what the purpose of that object is, and that telling Manuel, it's not okay, you don't get to change it. Um, then Aron, uh, starts to chase him and try to take the bottle. There actually is a struggle. They kind of get into a little scuffle. It's very loud, so don't be afraid because there's going to be some yelling. Um, and Aron then raises his voice and says, gimme, and yanks it from him. At which point the teacher steps in and tries to work it out with them. They're fighting off in the corner. They're not supposed <laughs> to do that. Um, notice how Alain strategically didn't move the video camera over to catch the fight. <laughs> no, actually it was fine. He winds up coming back and being really upset and he says, I don't like that. And then the teacher kind of works it out with him. Um, so what's happening there? So let's deconstruct that um, a little bit. So in this tiny, tiny little 10 second excerpt, 15 seconds, right? What's happening? We see, and I wanna highlight what Arong is doing specifically because he's, he's the focal child in this case. Um, but because of what he had set up and his intentions and how he had navigated this space and because of his positioning in this space as someone who really um, makes it possible for children to engage in these very elaborate scenarios because of all the work that he's done ahead of time, somebody comes in and changes something and that throws him off because that's not his intention and, and he's the one that sort of directs the play. Um, so Manuel comes in and, and tries to reappropriate the object. Um, Arong, um, tells him, he negates the peer's suggestion, saying, no, that's not what it is. That's not, that's not the way it's gonna happen. That's not the way it's gonna go. Um, by saying, that's not the Burger King, ponelo allá. By saying ponelo allá, he redirects the peer's action, saying, put it where it was, that's where it belongs. You don't get to move it. Um, and then he gives a description of what the object is supposed to be, right? So, es para tomar, es para el niño. It's for drinking, it's for the baby boy. He had just finished feeding the baby uh, with it. So he describes the play object, he defines the function in relation, in relation to his own play goals as a means to take it back, right? To take back the ownership. Um, and then he says, gimme, which is an explicit request for the object so that things can go as he planned and as he intended. Okay, so now another way that Arong um, uses language is to direct involvement in play. So we saw a little bit of that in this first excerpt, but here's some other, uh, some other ways that he directs everybody else's involvement. Um, this is an overview of what you're about to see in the video clip. This is a totally different day, a totally different scenario. He has now set up a restaurant. Um, and it's a very elaborate scene. He's also created a menu on a clipboard. He has all these things that he wrote, and so you'll see that in the video. He's alone because he's setting this whole thing up. As kids start to come in, Gabriela's the first girl that comes in, um, and he attempts to engage her in, um, in the play. So he says to her, table for one, sit down. Table for one, you want macaroni? Um, he pulls the chair out. He sort of directs her body into the chair and pushes the chair in behind her. So she sits up against the table. He um, puts the menu in front of her, um, showing her that he had written all this stuff and that supposedly macaroni was one of the options on the menu. Then comes Manuel into the play, and Manuel has all of this getup. I'm not really sure what he's dressed up as, but he's got this whole other idea for how the play is going to go. So he comes up to Gabriela, who's sitting at the table, and he says, tell you something, princesa, princesa, toma, and he gives her an object, right? So it's not about restaurant at that point, or at least he tries to change it. Um, Arong then comes back and instead of doing what he did with the previous um, situation where he was a little bit more aggressive, he does a Jedi mind trick and he says to um, Manuel, he pulls the chair behind him and says, siéntate, siéntate, Put, gives the menu to him and says, macaroni, want some macaroni? <laughs> so he totally engages the child in the direction of the play as he intended, even though um, had he left it up to Manuel, he would have changed it and made Gabriela the princess and I don't know what he gave her, it might have been a, a a flip-flop or something as a slipper, I'm not sure. So how does he use language? He uses language with Gabriela at first to seek her involvement in the play, 
explicitly requesting her to join the restaurant scene by saying table for one sit down. He purposefully integrates a play object, the menu that he created, and he specifically makes a suggestion for engaging in the play, which is, would you like macaroni? He moves on then to continue to use his language to serve him and to serve the purpose that he has established. When Manuel comes in and tries to change it up on him, he says, no, wait a minute, that's not the way it's gonna happen. He redirects Manuel's um, action. He explicitly uh, requests that he joins in the restaurant play by asking him or telling him to sit down, siéntate. He purposefully integrates the play object again, the menu, and he specifically provides a suggestion. Macaroni must have been the special that day. Um, so um, now I want to say just a few things. I have, I think, two minutes yeah, <laughs> to say something about Melissa because I do want to show you um, how she also used language, but in, in different ways. Um, she also was very skilled in the situation, but a very different bilingual. So she is a little bit younger. She was four years and four months. And I had already mentioned that she had strong receptive and expressive Spanish skills. She was an emergent English uh, proficient learner. And so her English, she certainly could use English for different purposes, but she wasn't as proficient in English as she was in Spanish. Um, she also used a variety of functions of talk and she contributed to social dramatic play through her language by being the creative set contributor. She was a really interesting child because she was one that was often left out of play and so her whole purpose in play was just to be let in, right? It's to use language to try to join people's play but she was very creative in how she did that and she was the one child who actually used language to set up play and to add abstractness to the play. And I'll show you some quick data examples of that. So she would be the child that would go beyond the concrete objects present. She would be the child that would say, hay un fuego, hay un fuego, there's a fire. Obviously there's no fire, right? Or she would say, it's raining outside. And so, you know, she would sort of, in, in that way and through language, she would expand and she would um, contribute to the play. But she was often left out of play. Um, she also was developing awareness and responsiveness to her peers and teachers' bilingual proficiencies, but in a different way. She used Spanish with Spanish dominant and uh, proficient bilingual peers, but with monolingual English peers or, or English dominant peers, that's when she code switched. So it's reverse of what Aron did. Um, and I won't show you the video because you can just see the transcript so that we can move along because I'm out of time. But I do want to show you how she asserted her position by trying to seek inclusion into the play. This is a really elaborate uh, situation, totally different um, setup. A parent had made kind of like an airplane, and I'll show you the picture of it, but it, it's sort of like the inside of an airplane and the children had put their seats in it and they were pretending to go somewhere. So somebody had taken on the role of pilot, which was Aidan. He says, pay attention everyone, where are we gonna go? One girl who's sitting in the front says, I wanna go to Hawaii. So you notice it's all in English, right? Aidan, who's the pilot, says, Hawaii? Everyone going to Hawaii? Like, are you on the right plane? Um, and Nina says, no, no, no. And she's going to Hawaii, points to Violet. Violet says, no, there's a little bit of confusion of where people are going. Then Dylan says, no, he, my mom, pointing to one of the girls. Melissa says, that's, my, that's where I come in. So she jumps in and says, y me too. I'm, I'm, yo soy tu mamá también. So if she takes on a position in that whole situation, she might be able to join the play. Um, that's what the airplane looked like. So you can see how it totally changed. Um, can you guys see it? A parent actually did that. It was really cool. Um, so what's happening here? She's drawing her bilingualism to gain entry into the play because at this point she's in that space, but she's being completely ignored. Aidan never asks her where she's going. Um, and so she asserts her position by taking on a role or self-assigning a role and by justifying the role. I'm a girl, I can be the mom, right? Um, some other examples of what I was talking about, the how she adds abstra abstractness. She's, she, and these are not from the same play um, situation. These are taken from different play situations. But she'll say things like, come on now, it's really raining, even though it wasn't raining outside, but so that people could sort of, you know, uh, think outside of the present. Um, Oye, dale que me voy para el tren. I'm leaving for the train, so you better speed the play up. And then in another situation, she does the fire thing, which was really funny because the other boy then goes and grabs the fire man um, costume out of the, you know, out of the costume box. And so that changes the direction of play, which is really creative of her. Um, so to finish, to summarize, um, we saw, and I'll just pull a, a few points out of here, but um, we saw how children moved and intermingled linguistic features from both languages to enhance language and literacy experiences and learning. And they enacted their bilingualism in ways that reflected language development um, and proficiencies and opportunities to learn. 
um, and to experiment with their language, uh, developing languages. And they also demonstrated sensitivity and responsiveness to peers and teachers' bilingualism by enacting their language uh, uses in different ways. So I, with those that I know are going to understand me, I'm either going to code switch or I'm going to use monolingual talk, depending on their own language proficiencies. And I'll stop there because I'm way over time. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Oh, thank you. Any questions if we even have a minute? Oh, we have five. Yeah, we have five. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for coming again. And after, I do hope you go lay out because it's so nice. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. So, what's, how, so, how does this help us with uh, our immersion programs and bilingual mm -hmm. programs? So, what, what, why do we really care about this? Why do you care about this? Well, why do I care about this? I'll tell you why I care about this and why I think it's important. Okay, um, this is not an immersion program. This is a program that is providing opportunities for children to be able to continue to develop um, the languages that are in their environment in ways that are purposeful and in ways that allows them to experiment with their developing languages. This is not a program that um, enacts or enforces a strict language separation policy on the part of the children because that's not developmentally appropriate for this age group. So it does provide some insight in terms of how um, early childhood programs can not only support the continuing development of bilingualism for children who already have that opportunity in their homes, but also provide opportunities for children who don't have those opportunities in their homes to gain experience and to learn how to navigate two languages for very purposeful um, things, right? Play is a really, really important area for children because they have complete agency in this space. And so what they're doing here is completely meaningful to them. Um, in terms of immersion programs, um, I can say that teachers can actually learn quite a bit about what's happening here because they can get a sense of how children um, draw on both of their languages and how they manipulate their languages to get their needs met. They also can get a sense of the facility that children have with each of their languages and who is more proficient for certain purposes with one of the languages and who perhaps needs some more experience for certain purposes with the other language. Yes. Well, it's so interesting. Where's Su Jung? I saw you come in. Su Jung and I are always having these conversations about peer effects mm -hmm. and social learning theory mm -hmm. and how kids' development, particularly in language, is so strongly affected by the input they're experiencing. That was such an incredible snapshot. I mean, we just met yesterday and talked about this for several hours. And especially when you were characterizing the emergent bilingual kids in terms of their heterogeneity mm -hmm. and showing that, um, you know, Melissa, Melissa, Melissa. had opportunity have her knowledge mm -hmm. in hands through her. I mean, it was a fascinating mm -hmm. glimpse of some of the pure effects mechanisms mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that so many people are interested in. Yeah. Yeah, and that you might think that because Melissa is not the strongest English speaker that she cannot participate, but she certainly finds ways to participate, and she does that by drawing on her bilingualism because she couldn't participate if she had to participate monolingually in English. She couldn't. She doesn't have those skills yet but she can participate through code switching because all of those kids have at least receptive, some level of receptive bilingual proficiency. And so she's not completely left out of the game and she finds these entry points. So it's really, really interesting to see how in these heterogeneous spaces, where the children happen to be, there's spaces and places for them to take part and to learn from each other. Yeah. I was wondering if you found any information on how they figured out who, who was proficient in what language. I was always because they would know. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I just, did you find anything as you watched their play? How the children knew Discover. who was? Yeah. yeah, because, well, one was very obvious just the language that the children generally chose to use. Right. And so by, they were very, very clear on, and, and particularly killed kids like Aron, children like Aron, who were flexibly bilingual, <clears throat> He knew Melissa's much more comfortable in Spanish, and so with her, I'm not gonna code switch. With her, I'm gonna use monolingual Spanish. But with the teacher, I could use either one because the teacher's gonna understand me. And with other friends that, are, that they choose when they come into the play, you hear them, they, they use monolingual English. Then Aron could turn, sort of switch, and use monolingual. He was, 
but not just him. So he's an exemplary case, but he represents generally um, the, the, not only the profiles of the children, so there were children like him that were proficiently bilingual for a four-year-old, right? Um, and flexibly bilingual, but he represents the profile. Um, all children were equally sensitive. Melissa was very aware of who spoke what and who preferred what. So it doesn't mean that these children can't use some level of the other language. It's that they prefer to use one language over the other. If they had to use the other language, they, they did, and generally they would do it with code switching. So code switching served as a scaffold for the children that were dominant in one of the languages, which is really interesting because for Aron, code switching served a different purpose. Code switching didn't serve as a scaffold. Code switching gave him sort of all this freedom and flexibility to say, I can use any language with this guy because this guy's going to understand me either way. Right. Yeah. Then did you notice differences between translations, um, like translating for Melissa, who may not be as proficient in English, was it, or, or at what point was the teacher stepping in? The teacher did not step in, and, there, and, the, and the kids didn't translate for each other. They did not translate for each other. What they did is they would switch the, um, the medium of their message. And so they would either switch from mixed language to monolingual language, either Spanish. But there was no translation. They negotiated in other ways. Um, we actually didn't know any translation. They would negotiate in other ways. They would either use more props or they would restate it um, in another way. Or they would just realize, I need to use some code switching with this child yeah, to help the play proceed. Yeah, mm -hmm, absolutely. And yeah, you saw when you know, they would say something completely monolingual English and then a, diff a child would come in and based on the language that child that came into play would use, then the, ch the, ne the child that was using monolingual English just prior would switch to either using both or using Spanish only. Yeah, so, Terry. So did they ever talk about language? Um, in this play, in, in the dramatic play, you mean, in that space? No, um, that at least not, it wasn't a finding that stood out that there was, you know, it wasn't a theme that they articulated or expressed um, their metalinguistic awareness. It was just something that they responded to. It wasn't something that they articulated, although there was a lot of meta talk about what they were doing, but not about the language they were doing it in. It was a given that either language worked in this space. It's just that it worked differently depending on who was in it. Yeah, but that's a really good question because that would be really interesting if they would say, I am now switching to English, but they didn't do that. <laughs> when, when my own children were little, my older child who grew up here um, speaking Spanish at home, and at, at one point I still remember we were, we were playing doctor and he said, I'm the doctor who speaks English. Uh -huh. No, he said it in Spanish. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh -huh. And that was like to say, okay, now that was it a trigger. has to be in English yeah, right, yeah. because I'm the doctor and he doesn't know Spanish. Right, right, right. Yeah, no, these kids never did that. What they did do was they would either switch gears, so they would switch to another language, but it was usually in, res they didn't switch language to sort of demand that other people spoke a particular language. They switched languages in response to who was coming into the situation. No language policies. Nope. They, they're bilingual. Anything count, either one counts because either one is valuable, right? And legitimate um, for playing. Yeah, so not anything, both of them. <laughs> yeah. Dr. Thank, thank you. Thank you for coming.